time where one of the amendments might be successful. And it seems wrong to me to rule one out, or rule them all out, on the basis that the first one happened not to be accepted uh, by, by the committee. But I just end, sir, by, by uh, reiterating what I said at the beginning, uh, that there are very few protections an opposition has uh, in, in the chamber and to, uh, to uh, right over the top of those because on a particular day it happens to be inconvenient with the amount of work that's been, that's been put up by way of the number of amendments uh, is, is quite wrong. This is not something that happens regularly in our parliament. There's a self-correcting mechanism to the whole thing and I think it would be wrong to take away that the last protections that an opposition has uh, when we're in the committee of the whole in a minority sense. Before I call the next member, I would urge uh, members in, in making points of order to keep them terse. These are not speeches. I realise you are covering issues that are interesting territory, but I would ask you keep the, the your con and, point and, of order brief. And, and, and sir, my, uh, my colleague has, I think, outlined very broadly uh, the, 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 the issue, and I would prefer just to make uh, a couple of pretty specific points. And Sorry? I apologise for that, sir. That's my phone. I'll ask someone to take it outside. Um, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the, the, the three points that I want to make is that uh, Erskine May is, is quite clear, uh, but it does, uh, and, and being a lack of precedent um, in New Zealand, that would be the fallback uh, position. But, sir... Um, there is some precedent for this sort of amendment being accepted and my colleague has referred to one and I think you will, um, if you cast your mind back, remember that, that it is a procedure that's been used in the past and, and generally it has been negated by the government um, where the government has, has, has um, um, moved in a way which it can in the House by shifting the day, sometimes only by one day itself, and that way, meaning that none of these further amendments uh, can be considered. Sir, I, um, I disagree with the Chairman's suggestion that um, uh, amendments can be made at the first and second reading of this House. This, this House, as a full House, has not had the opportunity to specifically look at that question. This is the time for any amendment to be made. The, the, he's quite right that the committee could have considered it and possibly if the House was of a mind to, the House could have sent it back to the committee um, after, after the report back in order for that to happen. But, but this is the first time this matter uh, has been specifically um, addressed. So, so my point is essentially Erskine May is a fallback position um, that I can accept and I differ somewhat from my colleague um, uh, that shifting a date day by day is something which is substantially the same but where there are big gaps between the start and the end point and a wide range of options uh, my suggestion sir is that the proper thing would, to do would be to rule many of them out and I could even say most of them or three quarters of them uh, but, sir, there is enough difference uh, between some of these, if we accept the substantially the same argument, uh, for, for a range of them uh, to be put to the House. Sir, I, I, I know we're in... I mean, this is, um, no, this is the stuff that the ruling which is given here is one which will, uh, no doubt, appear in a Green Book in the, in the future, one way or the other, uh, because we are into unprecedented... Uh, territory, uh, and, and and it is my it is my view, sir, that in doing so, the speaker should um, make a ruling which um, protects the right, the very few rights that the minority have, as long as they're not being totally unreasonable. And I I I I can accept that putting all of these amendments would be totally unreasonable, but sir, that doesn't mean that. All of them should be ruled out. The Honourable Chair, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I think in the um, opening remarks uh, on this issue to you by the shadow leader of the House, there was a little bit of a betrayal about why, in fact, we find ourselves in these positions. And I, I say this only because those remarks went uh, unchecked for quite a long time. Uh, the, the reality is that uh, 
Uh, I understand his disappointment, but there we are. We're in this situation. Mr Speaker, oh, I, want I, to... I just urge the Honourable Member, please, to, to uh, the, the, the contributions uh, have been of good quality. I don't want to see a deterioration of this procedural uh, discussion under points of order. It is an important uh, procedural issue, and I, I'd ask the Member to just to respect that. Mr Speaker, it is indeed a very important procedural issue, but I would ask that you check the hand side. Uh, just to assure yourself as to, that, oh, as to that quality in the opening statements from the, leader, the shadow leader of the House. Mr Speaker, there are two speakers' rulings that I think are relevant here, as well as the conclusion reached by uh, Chairman Rick Barker this afternoon, which I strongly support. Now, those two are on a page 112, number 6, and page 113, number 1. The first one goes to the issue of relevancy. Uh, and, Mr Speaker, the most important point there is 6.4. It's been ruled on by speakers uh, continually uh, over a, a long period, um, up until, um, in fact, I think I, I note here that was, obviously there was a problem with this sort of thing in the, the late uh, 1800, early 1900s. Uh, but the point still remains that if an amendment is in conflict with the provisions of the bill, uh, then it is not relevant. Further, Mr Speaker, uh, coming to uh, 113.1, a bill can be amended only in ways that are relevant to the text. It cannot be turned into something that it is not and did not start out as. And Mr Speaker, uh, the text reference in here is most important because we are repeatedly reminded in this House that there are occasions where the courts will turn to Hansard debates, to select committee reports, uh, to a range of uh, commentary on a bill as it passes through its passages in this House uh, for some guidance as to how it should be read. And I would suggest, sir, that, uh, that it's been abundantly clear for a very long time that this bill was to commence on 1 July 2010, uh, to have its effect from that point. Um, and we know, sir, that there is a reason, there is, there is a need to have some provisions of this bill dealt with by 1 April of this year as well, so that people dealing with it have a fair and reasonable amount of time before that. To accept a series of amendments that of themselves uh, do not uh, substantially change the initial intent of the preceding amendment uh, and let that run out for some thousand amendments, or in other words nearly three years of date changes, I think, sir, does contravene uh, the idea that uh, it is turning the, the bill into something that it did not start out as, and I think it also uh, is in conflict with the provisions of the bill and the purpose of the bill in the first place. As to the issue of there being no certainty uh, about the, the voting support for any one amendment or the other, uh, that would be assuming, sir, that in the few intervening seconds between a vote being put for one day and a vote being put for, a next, for the next, an entire government coalition could, dis could deconstruct uh, and there'd be some sudden change that no one in the House knew about. Uh, that, sir, I think is an implausible position uh, and, and uh, is an argument that can't be run too strongly. But on those two other long-standing speakers' rulings, I think the conclusion reached by Mr Barker today is the correct one. I've, I've, I'll accept the Honourable Dr Nick Smith, uh, it, so long as he's brief, because I'm ready to... I think interesting issues oh, have been Chairman, raised, and I'm ready to rule on uh, them. Mr Speaker, as the Minister and the Chair, I just want to make a brief point in the sense of the relevance of Parliament. I would suggest to you, Mr Speaker, this is a little of a try-on. We have 1,066 amendments tabled, most of which would shift the commencement's day by just one day. If uh, the House is to allow every one of those amendments to be put, that's going to take about 15, 16 hours of members of this House, 120, a House that costs over $15,000 an hour to run, being spent on not debate, and New Zealanders expect issues to be robustly debated in the House, and I welcome that. But I think as a pragmatic speaker that's been interested in the quality of this institution of Parliament, serving the interests of the public at large. Is that interest best served by spending 15 hours voting on amendments that would vary it by one day? The second point I'd make in response to those that have been made by Mr Mallard 
is that well, what the government needs to do is to move the very first amendment to change the date from that which is in the bill, 